Hello once again, AP Calculus students. We are still talking about section 4.2 in the Larson textbook. Finding the area under the curve and our focus is on the limit process in which to do that at this time. And our example 4 here uh, is asking us to find the area that lies between the curve y equal x cubed the x-axis and uh, stationed on the interval from 0 to 1. And I've gone ahead and provided a blank coordinate plane here that I think it's going to be somewhat beneficial, at least visually, to interpret what's happening by uh, going ahead and sketching a graph of y equal x cubed. Hopefully we understand that that says your typical cubic. Uh, it does pass through the origin. It's always increasing. Sort of looks like a somewhat of an S shape. And for our purpose here, I might over-exaggerate it just a little bit. And we'll say that it looks something like this it would have a point of inflection there at the origin. So we'll call this um, the graph y equal x cubed and of course our 0 would be at the origin and our x equal 1 we'll put say right there. Now the goal of this problem is to find out how much space is occupied under that curve and above the x-axis from the 0 to the 1. And we're going to find this area by uh, using a, a rather rigorous process called the limit process. But one thing that the limit process uh, does entail that I hope that we can all sort of agree upon is that the typical area of the geometric figure that we're going to be discussing, which is a rectangle, is length times width. Now, once again, We've been dealing with lots of rectangles in this particular section. And if I were to use rectangles to start partitioning this off, I really can't state how wide the rectangles are because it is somewhat arbitrary at this point. So we would have several of them that would look something like this. Now, these I know are not rectangles at this particular time, but they certainly could be if we capped them off uh, either by using the right end or the left end and I'm going to choose to use the right end point. There's a very important reason for that decision. So essentially I'm finding the area of all of these rectangles and the many more that follow. Well, to find the width, it's a, a relatively easy process here because the width is just defined to be the entire length of your interval, 0 to 1, so take the right side minus the left side, 1 minus 0, and then divide by how many rectangles or how many subintervals, how many partitions you're going to have. We don't know that answer, so we'll call it 1. So there's your width, 1 divided by n. Now to find the length, it's a slightly different situation because we do have to utilize the equation of the curve, which I'm going to temporarily kind of replace the y with, uh, whoops, I'm going to replace the y with function notation. I'm going to call this f of x equal x cubed. Now, the reason why I do that is because I can, uh, I can better name the value of the length by referencing the function. The length would be the function f evaluated at each one of these right endpoints of these rectangles. Now each one of those right endpoints is just simply going to be some type of a multiple of the width. 1 over n times 1, 1 over n then times 2, then times 3, etc. So why not use 1 over n times some counter i that I can let ultimately be various uh, whole numbers here in just a moment in, in way of a summation expression. So if I were to put my length times width together, I would have 1 over n times f of i over n with the summation that allows i to go from 1 to n. And then the limit process comes into play by saying, hey, how many n's do we want to deal with here? Well, I want quite a few. In fact, I want an inf infinite number. So we'll let n approach infinity in a limit. And this expression will compute not just an approximate area under this curve, but it'll do a very, very good job. It'll get us an exact answer. Now, our next step is to leave the function notation because we do have a specific function here, x cubed to be exact. 
So we'll go ahead and we'll replace the x within the x cubed with i over n. And of course that gives us i cubed over n cubed. And then if I simplify this a little further um, by noticing that I have a constants of 1 over n and 1 over n cubed. Now let's take note. This n and this n cubed that's highlighted in orange uh, are indeed playing the role of constants within this summation because the only thing that's changing within the summation is the letter i. Now I don't want to bring out the 1 over n to the fourth in front of the limit though. That would be bad because the limit does affect whatever has an n attached to it. So the 1 over n to the fourth will only come out in front of the summation. And now you'll notice that we have um, hopefully a, a rather familiar summation expression, i cubed. Perhaps uh, oh, a day or so ago in your class you had discussed uh, various summation properties. And i cubed does have a, 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 a formula, I guess, that uh, is attached to it that we'll go ahead and write down right now. And the fact of the matter is that the summation of i cubed is defined to be n squared times the quantity n plus 1 squared, all divided by 4. And now you've pretty much whittled this problem down to be just a, an infinite limit type question, a limit at infinity. And uh, the summation has done its job, so it exits the problem. And if you're able to kind of uh, tell me what the coefficients are of the uh, n to the fourth that's in the numerator and the coefficient of the n to the fourth that's in the denominator, then I would say that you've probably uh, put yourself in a position where you can answer this question. Um, and a lot of students will be able to do that. The answer is going to be one fourth. But if that's bothering you a little bit, don't worry about it. We can do some algebra to uh, further investigate what the uh, answer is going to be. And what I would suggest is just to spend some time and go ahead and expand out the binomial n plus 1, which of course is n squared plus 2n plus 1, all divided by 4, of course. And then I'll go ahead and write everything in one single fraction, where the denominator would be 4n to the 4th, and the numerator would be n to the 4th plus 2n cubed plus n squared, and then we can see that the limit is easily going to be found because we have a degree of 4 both in the numerator and the denominator and serving as our highest exponent. And the coefficient of the n to the fourth on top is 1. So our answer is 1 fourth. And that indeed would be the area that would lie underneath the curve above the x-axis between 0 and 1. It's a really neat process, the limit process. It is a bit rigorous, but essentially what happens is that you have so many of these rectangles so close together that this little extra area that we seem to not have wanted when we were doing just a few right side rectangles becomes quite negligible when there are so many of those rectangles um, with an infinitesimal width thrown into the picture. So area is one fourth.